Many believe that sleep apnea has always been with us. However, low awareness among the general public and within the medical community itself is a serious problem. Low awareness can result in delayed diagnosis and impact the effectiveness of treatment. The reasons why are many and not without some controversy. One matter that is not disputed is that early detection is essential and improving awareness is key. Increased awareness will improve and may even save many lives. These speakers shared stories of their journeys to treatment in the hope that others will benefit from the lessons learned along the way. We thank them for their strength and generosity of spirit. My mother had a saying and it was el sueño es la vida, sleep is life. I didn't realize just how true that was until I started learning and I'm still learning of how this has affected me and may and has affected me definitely and continues. I start realizing how tired I was feeling. I start realizing that I was starting to sleep while I was doing interviews of my clients and I didn't realize what I had just told them. Uh, and as a lawyer, that's a scary thought. I started going to court and realizing I couldn't think what the name of that objection was because it wouldn't come to mind. I was driving home and I was at a stoplight and I fell and I actually had a dream and I didn't realize how long I'd been there. I woke up and I told my family, my sister in particular this morning, I said, I'm dying. And she says, what are you saying? I said, I don't know. It's this instinct feeling that I have right here is the only thing I could say. I said, I'm dying. Didn't realize that I had a, a, a family member who was a doctor and they took me aside and they said to me, there's something going on. It is not normal how you just sleep. I said, well, it's a Sunday and this is the only time I take naps, which wasn't true because I was trying to come home for lunch and take two hour naps. And he said to me, we believe that you have sleep apnea. And he began to explain a little bit of what that is. He made my doctor's appointment and he gave me the first monies to make sure I got it done. I did the home study and I came back and a couple of days they told me, um, uh, the look was, they looked at the monitor and the results of their computer. And they looked at me and they looked back and they looked at me and I realized something's going on. And they said, you're very severe. I had 83 episodes in one hour for an average of 19 seconds. And uh, you need some, we need to do something for you. So there, it just still took a little while to get it, but I got my machine. And it was, it's really incredible that you don't know that you're not sleeping well until you do sleep well. Uh, I met my wife when... Uh, she was 18 and I was 20, and over the years she said, you know, you hold your breath when you, when you sleep. You stop breathing. Constantly would tell me that, that you don't, don't sleep well. And then as the years went on, it would get worse, and I think that does, does happen as you get older and things start to relax and so forth. Went to the doctors, you know, started seeing doctors. My, my family was going, you're manic, you need to go see doctors. So you start seeing psychologists and psychiatrists and everybody starts pushing at you. It feels like your world's collapsing and all of a sudden you're seeing doctors. I was literally driving to a stress test that I was late for to try to see if a stress test was causing these micro sleeps. I had been saying to myself, you need to stop and take a nap. I didn't stop. The next thing I heard was the bang where I had, I had hit a minivan. Everybody walked away from that accident. The fireman said, it's rare that I see it come out this good. That woke everybody up. Yeah. Um, this is a prevalent disease, and it is linked to mental illness. I can guarantee you, I'm a scientist and an engineer. I base my, my, things on f my, 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 my conclusions on facts and what I see around me, and especially on what I experience. I think that this disease plays a significant role in it and in our society. Back in 2013, I'm assuming I had sleep apnea well before that. People just kept yep. telling me I'm, I'm not breathing. I said, ah, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry I'm snoring. I don't want to wake you up. But finally, someone convinced me to go to the sleep study, and I got the, uh, the sleep apnea machine right away, literally that week. So I figured that for years, I guess that was impacting me. So I'm happy about it now. Type A personality. Oh, you know, work very hard. Normal work week is 60 to 80 hours a week. That's how uh, I lived for 20, 30 years. Push, 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 live, 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 work hard. I was also extreme uh, physically fit. I danced as a uh, leisure activity, took dance classes, took yoga classes, hiked, spent time outside, walked every day. I was skinny. <laughs> I didn't meet any of the criteria for sleep apnea, and I had a horrible time sleeping. Three and four weeks would go by, and I wouldn't have slept. 
Insomnia was, you know, the only way I could describe it for doctors. I had enough of these doctors who wanted to treat me with more pills. I always woke up foggy-headed. I was miserable. I was more miserable after the medication than I was during it. The way it affected my life was pretty direct. I had employment issues. I was irritable, uncomfortable. There was a period of time I got fired constantly because I didn't know how bitchy I was. I didn't know how unprepared I was. All I know is that I was groggy, foggy-headed. I wasn't optimum. And I have to indicate, I'm smart. You know, I have multiple degrees. I took all kinds of tests and proved that I'm a functioning normal person when I'm awake. Just so that you could believe it, I've been diagnosed now and, and a compliant patient for 12 years. And we all have so much potential. We have all so much potential we could be giving more to this world. And I hope that you all join me in, in making this, uh, this possibility change so that there's better, better treatment for sleep apnea for everyone. Hi, my name is Debbie McCall, and I actually live with three sleep apnea patients. Yeah, honestly, it's always snoring at my house. But my husband was one of those holding his breath type. I knew it as soon as we started dating, he had sleep apnea, but it took me years to get him in for a sleep study because it didn't apply to him, of course. I've always had some sort of sleep deprivation that, uh, that changed the way a normal person would feel. I can tell you that I never thought I had a sleep disorder. I felt the way that I felt, but it was normal to feel the way that I felt because of the life that I lived. I was always busy, so yes, I'm always tired. It was normal. But, uh, but in the last several years, and only because I have felt the same way in the last few years as I felt for all of my life, that I realized that I have always had sleep apnea. Sleep tests for sleep apnea don't necessarily pick up on narcolepsy. We have people who have been diagnosed with one or the other, and they have been good, compliant patients who have, you know, taken their medications or used their CPAP, and they're still tired. But we have kids who have sleep apnea and narcolepsy. And if you diagnose one and treat one, you're only hitting part of the problem and so the kid is still falling asleep in school and they are still failing a grade they are still losing they are still sleeping through algebra one and if you sleep through algebra one all the rest of your math classes are harder in 1982 i met this beautiful 19 year old young lady who did later of 1983 became my wife well the first night that we had spent together as man and woman I wake up in the morning and there's this beautiful young lady sitting on the corner of the bed with this look of horror on her face. And I kind of woke up and looked at her going, geez, it wasn't that bad, was it? <laughs> but she goes, no, she goes, I thought you were going to die. And I looked and I said, why? And she started telling me, you know, I had stopped breathing, I was choking, I was snoring, I was thrashing around. I said, well, that's the way it was. Well, 10 years later, 1992, she comes home from the dentist with an article that she read in a magazine. She goes, here, they wrote a story about you. And there it was. It was all about sleep apnea, and it was about me. And I think where uh, society is lacking, where the medical profession is lacking, where the insurance companies are lacking, are the, imp are the importance they put on sleep. It's sleep is one of the three pillars of life. There's sleep, nutrition, and exercise. Without good nutrition, you're going to be sick. Without exercise, we know what happens. Well, without good sleep, you're a crappy person, <laughs> you know, besides not feeling well. We need to have a process, and a process that ne needs to be established. First of all, find out about sleep. The medical doctors need to know the primary physicians how important the sleep is. Okay, second of all, we need when our DMEs are coming in to explain and to teach people, you know, how to use them. So I've always been a heavy snorer, and, um, and I think it kept getting worse, and I finally realized that I needed medical attention when I woke up and realized I'd been sitting at a, at a traffic light for a long time asleep. I went to my primary care physician. He said, it's a possibility you have sleep apnea. I'm going to send you to an ENT. He'll probably have a study done, which is exactly what happened. And uh, I was diagnosed 
and given a CPAP machine, and that made a world of difference in my life because I no longer had to worry about falling asleep in dangerous places or places are embarrassing or maybe even causing me to lose my job if I fell asleep at work. Because at that point, I did not know sleep apnea. I had never heard the term sleep apnea. I didn't know anyone. I know now that I know people that had sleep apnea. I believe I've had, in fact, I'm certain I've had uh, sleep apnea my, uh, probably most of my life. And it really became serious for me. And I didn't realize that I'd had sleep apnea, but I had to start to try to deal with the symptoms. When I was flying and we were deployed, and there came times when I, I would just be so tired that I'd be falling asleep in the airplane. And so I went to the uh, flight surgeon, and the guy goes, damn. And, he said, and I said, what? He said, do you snore? I said, yes, I've been told that I do. And he says, you need to get checked for sleep apnea. But as I was still deployable, I got the oral device. But it didn't really solve the sleep issues because I, um, I still was tired. Uh, after the birth of my first child in 2010, uh, I had gestational diabetes with that pregnancy. And after that, I started to notice a lot of disparate uh, health outcomes that I thought were uh, unrelated. Um, I was having chronic pain and, and spasming in my back. I was extremely fatigued, which I chalked up to being up with a baby all the time. Um, I was starting to have memory and concentration problems at work. I was getting ill all the time. Uh, every time a cold or flu uh, would go through the community, I would get it. Um, I was snoring extremely badly, which I had never done before. Um, and I didn't really know that all of these things could be connected and have a root cause. Um, several years later, my parents were both diagnosed with sleep apnea. One has obstructive and one has central sleep apnea. Um, but even then, I didn't quite put together that a lot of the things I was suffering from might have some common causality. And we've heard today about the lack of information or appropriate education, counseling, training, um, access to knowledgeable folks just not having the right level of instruction, ongoing support that you need. Certainly something that ASAA and our partners here in the room can think about. How do we fill that gap? That seems like a, kind of a, a low-hanging fruit. 